Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I want to begin by saying that the SWEEK program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. I want to welcome you all to the first event of USF's week program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice for the spring semester, where tonight Dr. Chris Silver will use phonograph records to walk us through the outsized role that North African Jews played in developing music through the Maghreb. If you don't know what a phonograph is, I can't really help you there. <laughs> My name is Oren Kroll-Zeldin, and I am the assistant director of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice. I want to begin by thanking the uh, SWIG JSSJ faculty and staff, as well as the Department of Theology and Religious Studies for co-sponsoring this event. I'm going to speak a, somewhat of an outsized introduction, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Silver for the really interesting part, but I want to say a few things to contextualize this evening and who we are as a program. So let me tell you a little bit about the SWIG JSSJ program. It was founded in 1977. Uh, this program is the first Jewish studies chair or program at a Catholic university anywhere on planet Earth. In 2008, we were reestablished as the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice, the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish Studies and Social Justice. Including a minor in this field, in the classroom, the program offers a wide range of significant Jewish Studies courses not found in other educational settings. Beyond the classroom, we offer extraordinary events that are free and open to the public, such as this evening's event. We have a full slate of six, in my opinion, very exciting and interesting events for the semester, and I want to tell you briefly what they are. On February 19th at 6.30 p.m., we have an event called Palestine in the Art of Resistance with Palestinian-American mural artist Chris Gazale, and if you know San Francisco well, you have probably seen his art around the city, maybe without knowing that it is him. On March 1st at 6.30, we have an event that is the uh, annual social justice lecture called Imposter Syndrome, Intersectionality and Authenticity as a Lived Experience with renowned chef and writer Michael Twitty. On March 19th, at what time? 6.30. We have an event called Anti-Occupation Activism, Trumpism, and White Nationalism in America with Simone Zimmerman, who is the director of B'Tselem USA and is one of the co-founders of If Not Now. On April 1st at 6.30, we have an event called Social Justice and Israel-Palestine. This is a book launch for a newly published book with the same title and the book launch will fe feature one of the editor's books, uh, Professor Aaron Han Tapper, who is the director of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice. And this event will also feature numerous of the contributors to the book, including myself. So you should come to all of them, not just that one. On April 13th at 6.30 p.m. We have a social justice Passover Seder with the theme Immigrants, Refugees, and Borders, which will be led by Rabbi Camille Angel and a group of USF students. Lastly, I want to formally announce an exciting new program that we are launching this summer, summer 2020. The JSSJ program will be offering a three-week Arabic language intensive program, exactly, called Arabic San Francisco. The program will take place here on campus at USF from July 13th to 31st. 
and it will coincide with our long-running Hebrew San Francisco program, which is now in its 23rd consecutive summer. The focus of Arabic San Francisco will be on the Levantine dialect of Arabic, although students in level one will spend the first part of the program learning to read and write in Arabic. There are flyers for both Arabic and Hebrew San Francisco at the door when you walked in. If you have any questions about either program, <coughs> please come up and talk to me afterwards. Also, if you would like to learn more about the SWIG JSSJ program, also out there by the door, there are some green booklets that you are free to take on the way out that will tell you a whole lot of information about the program. And also, if you want to sign up for our listserv, um, there's a sign-in sheet there as well. There should be a pen right next to it. We'll send you no more than one email a month. That's a pledge. <laughs> Though the SWIG JSS, through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, Education is fundamental, we believe, to making our world better. Paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are, who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. And now, let me formally introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Chris Silver is the Siegel Family Assistant Professor in Jewish History and Culture in the Department of Jewish Studies at McGill University. He holds a PhD from UCLA, a BA from UC Berkeley, and has received numerous grants and awards for his cutting edge research on Jewish music in North Africa. His most east recent article, which I was excited to see, was just published in the International Journal of Middle East Studies, is called The Sounds of Nationalism, Music, Moroccanism, and the Making of Sami El Maghribi, who was a Jewish musician and Moroccan superstar in the mid-20th century. Dr. Silver has spent years flipping through stacks at record stores in Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, France, and other places he can probably tell us more about and has amassed an impressive archive of 78 RPM records by Jewish and Muslim musicians from North Africa. In 2017, he launched Gramophone, a digital humanities platform that formally houses the impressive archive online, thereby making his record collection widely accessible to people like us. So, thank you for doing that, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Silver to the University of San Francisco. Thanks for having me. Uh, first, uh, let me talk about the technical, and then let me just uh, thank everyone. Uh, I'm going to attempt to show a PowerPoint tonight. Hopefully everything will work, but it's technology, so we'll see. Uh, I'm also going to attempt to play some audio. Hopefully that'll work. If it doesn't, bear with me, and, and we'll, we'll do our best to make it work. Uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Aaron and Oren and uh, uh, the program here at USF uh, for having me. Uh, it warms my heart to be here, uh, in large part because I'm coming from Montreal, where it was just minus 25 Celsius. So uh, thank you for the warm, for the warm uh, welcome. At the end of the 19th century, a young Algerian Jew by the name of Edmond Nathan Yafil embarked on a mission to save the soul of his musical heritage, one that he referred to as Arab and Muslim. He was in the right place at the right time and was just the visionary to do so. Born in the lower Kasbah of Algiers in 1874, Yafil had grown up mere steps from a number of cafes that provided stage for the capital's leading musicians of the multimodal sweet music born of medieval Al-Andalus, known as the Nuba. From his perch at Makhluf Lubia, his father's restaurant, 
Yafil was reared on the sounds of the era's undisputed master, Sheikh Mohammed bin Ali Sfinja. Indeed, the Muslim virtuoso of the Andalusian Oud, the Quitra, performed nightly at Cafe Malakaf, the cafe still in existence which sat opposite the elder Yafil's greasy spoon. The younger Yafil would have had occasion to see Sfinja up close as well. Makhlouf Lubia was known to feed Sfinja and his Muslim and Jewish disciples. Yafil, in turn, also ventured to Café Malikov, which was frequented by an overlapping group of, quote, Jews and a young guard of music lovers, end quote, as later recalled by Yafil's successor, Mahidin Bashtarzi. But Yafil was more than just a music lover. Bashtarzi, whose fame would in time surpass that of his mentor, described Yafil not just as a patron of Sfinja, but one with a plan for preserving his voice in perpetuity. To Yafil, Sfinja, born in 1844, seemed to be the last of his generation. With him, it was thought would go his music, their music. While a feeling of imminent loss had long infused the Nuba, that sentiment was diffused throughout music and throughout Algeria as Yafil came of age in the 1890s. After more than half a century of French colonization, major changes had been wrought to the former Ottoman territory. The Algerian capital, for instance, was destroyed and reconfigured, making way for growing numbers of European settlers who contributed directly to the decimation of Algeria's Muslim population. French policy had also reordered the Jewish-Muslim relationship, at least legally. The Khemu Decree of 1870, for example, forced most Algerian Jews to take French citizenship. Muslims, meanwhile, re retained their subject status. For Algerian Jews, the decades after the enactment of Khemu carried with them grave consequences alongside social advancement. Waves of violent settler anti-Semitism were unleashed. Yafil and Sfinja were direct witness to this. In 1898, French settler mobs attacked Makhlouf Lubia, along with a thousand other Jewish-owned properties in Algiers. With the traditional order and traditions themselves under threat, rescue became the watchword of Yafil, who grasped, as did other reformers, that time was running out. In the late 1890s, Yafil began to compile endangered Andalusian song texts with the aid of Sfinja and his Jewish disciple, Laho Saror. This was no easy task. Musicians were loath to hand over the unique manuscripts in their possession on which their livelihoods depended. Nonetheless, Yafil made significant progress. By 1904, he released his masterwork, a 400-page compendium of never-before-printed Andalusian song texts known as the Majmu' al-Aghani wal-Han min Kalam al-Andalus, the collection of songs and melodies from the words of al-Andalus. Yafil's magnum opus was actually two compilations, the Arabic language Majmu' and the Judeo-Arabic Diwan al-Aghani min Kalam al-Andalus, the treasury of songs from the words of al-Andalus. But the Diwan was published simultaneous to the Majmu' spoke at once to two issues we will soon address. First, to the outsized presence of Jewish musicians in Algeria, and second, to the fact that said population continued to speak, to read, speak, and sing in their native tongue more than three decades after Khemu threatened its existence among them. For the twin 1904 publications, identical in their musical content, Yafil had worked tirelessly to surface the hoarded manuscripts of Muslim and Jewish singers, as he announced in the Majmu paid off. Yafil had reconstituted much of the Nuba from its scattered pieces, which just caused the local and global music community heralded his singular accomplishment, which remains among the most critical works on Andalusian music to this day. Incredibly, by 1904, the 30-year-old Yafil was just beginning. In the years following, Yafil founded a free Arab music school in Algiers, which by 1912 he had transformed into al Mutrabiya the first modern Andalusian orchestra, not just in Algeria, but in all of the Maghreb. Its members, Jewish nearly to the one, donned their signature tarbush and tuxedo for each and every performance over the next two and a half decades. At al Mutrabiya's helm, Yafil made a number of discoveries that forever altered the soundscape of his fellow Algerians. Among them, Bashtarzi, the Muslim tenor already mentioned, for whom the Algerian National Theater is now named.
Had your feel done any one of these things, it would have been cause enough to, to take stock of his career. But he hardly stopped there. By 1923, in one additional example, Yafil was installed as the first chair of Arab music at the Algiers Conservatory. Indeed, from the end of the 19th century, through his premature death in 1928, there was no figure more central to Andalusian music in Algeria than Edmund Nathan Yafil. Yet as scholars before me have acknowledged, Yafil's archival paper trail runs frustratingly thin. between here and uh, the PowerPoint is keeping everybody awake and alert. So his archival paper trail runs frustratingly thin. What this unfortunate lack has resulted in, as Jonathan Glasser has argued, is an ambiguous legacy for Yafil, at least beyond the circle of Maghrebi musicians and aficionados for whom he is known and appreciated. But even within that circle, the Algerian Jew proves difficult to locate within what would seem to be his most natural genealogy, given what we know. That is, as a mediator between two towering Muslim musical figures, Sfinja, Yafil's source, and Bashtarzi, his beneficiary. I contend that Yafil's ambiguity may very well have to do with a certain flattening of his biography and the concomitant erasure of an industry. In other words, while scholars have relied heavily on particular components of Yafil's published material in order to place him within a classical high art Andalusian lineage rooted in the past and with just cause, a trove of other documents, which also bore his name, brand, and imprint, positioned, positioned him as something new, modern, and even nationalist. Thus, while Yafil was certainly a bridge to an earlier moment, the Algerian Jew was also a forward-looking musical nation builder who worked mostly behind the scenes in a business now 120 years old that we know almost nothing about that is recording as it emerged in the Maghreb. Here, as we see in this slide, Yafil's legacy is far from ambiguous. Instead, the impresario lies at the center of a modern North African industry in which one also finds an overwhelmingly Jewish infrastructure of music makers and music purveyors who serve to spread and sell Arab music old and new from Morocco to Tunisia in staggering numbers for well over half a century. So what are the stakes of this intervention? What are we all doing here together besides eventually, eventually listening to some music? I promise. To begin with, I would suggest that an interrogation of a nodal point in a global apparatus that supported among the most monumental technological innovations of the last century and a half is a worthy endeavor. It will no doubt raise new questions that demand answers. But our purposes for today are at once more focused and at the same time more lofty. Recording as an industry and recordings themselves, I argue, may well enable us to rethink modern Jewish history across the Maghreb and the Jewish-Muslim relationship therein. In this way, this talk, based on my current book project, confronts two intertwined inherited narratives. The first has privileged the theme of emancipation to assimilation, of North African Jews and their relationship to France and French institutions, including the Jewish educational system of the Alliance Israelite Universelle. It is an oft-told story of the rapid embergeoisement of Jews that followed the French occupation of Algeria in 1830, Tunisia in 1881, and Morocco in 1912, in which, and I'm paraphrasing here, quote, Jews quickly divested of their North African traditions, spoke French in place of Arabic, and became European, end quote. The second narrative is intimately related. Here, scholars agree that in drawing closer to French language and culture, and in the Algerian case, becoming French citizens, Jews were cleaved from Muslims, a rupture Benjamin Stora has referred to as exile. That exile inevitably set Jews and Muslims on divergent political paths in which the former appear to have abstained from the interwar and postwar anti-colonial nationalism of the latter. That force of nationalism resulted in independence for the countries of the Maghreb in the 1950s and 1960s, and a final exile for Jews from Muslims through their departure from North Africa in the course of decolonization. Given all of this, where does Edmond Nathan Yafil fit in? What do we do with a young Arabophone Jew, 
the son of a restaurateur born four years after the Khamu decree, who came to learn French imperfectly, who never attended the Alliance, who remained enmeshed with Muslims, who donned the same tarbouche and suit as a group of proto-nationalist reformers known as the Young Algerians, and whose musical activities were even in step with the Nahda, the movement of Arab cultural renaissance associated with the Middle East. For that matter, how do we make sense of an interwar figure like Tunis the Tunisian Jewish Habiba Masika, North Africa's first superstar, whose anti-colonial nationalist records inspired Muslim and Jewish audiences as far west as Morocco and beyond. And the largely Jewish class of, su of suppliers of Masika's subversive sounds, who understood well the consequences of their trade and her records, but nonetheless passed those discs across borders to the great frustration of the French authorities. What story do they tell? Finally, what happens to critical historiographical timelines when considering the case of Sami El Maghrabi, a Moroccan Jewish musician, a few equals at mid 20th century, whose rise to fame is framed by the improbable years of 1948 to 1956, and who provided the Moroccan march to independence with its very soundtrack. In our time together today, we'll come to a focus on recordings made by Yafil, Masika, and Al Maghrabi in an attempt to answer these questions in order to render the Jewish Muslim past in the Maghreb in its own voice. With that, and armed with new sources, we return to Yafil. In 1902, the London-based gramophone company registered their trademark in Algeria, in Tunisia. Like the French Pate label, which had released cylinders of Andalusian music the prior year, it was an early start in the region for the multinational. Despite their advanced entry, Gramophone's initial showing in Algeria and Tunisia was disappointing at best. In both territories, the label had stagnated under their local representative, a non-Jewish Frenchman in Algiers named De Simon. In April 1906, a frustrated Alfred Clark, the director of Gramophone's French subsidiary, demanded that De Simon, quote, reinvigorate the Algerian market, end quote. He was especially concerned that increased competition from German, German labels would marginalize Gramophone in North Africa. Some months later, Clark dispatched American sound engineer Charles Chopin to remedy the situation. In Algiers and Tunis, Chopin record, recorded 216 single-sided flat discs. Those masters were then sent to Gramophone's pressing plant in Hanover, Germany. 100 of those sides were subsequently transformed into 50 double-sided commercial discs. As a first run, only 24 copies of each record were shipped back to the Maghreb for sale. To be sure, the output was rather meager. Nonetheless, Gramophone still saw great potential. As Clark soon understood, however, the company possessed neither the right access nor representation. In 1908, Clark traveled to Algeria to investigate. Upon arrival, he wrote to Gramophone's managing director, Theodore Birnbaum, in London. Quote, I found that in Algiers itself, there were two people who dealt considerably in talking machines, Kony and a Mr. Yafil, an Algerian Jew who has an establishment in the native town, end quote. While the Paul Colin company, established in Algeria since 1903, impressed, Yafil was far more difficult to ignore. Clark added that, quote, before the advent of the disc talking machine, Yafil made phonograph records on cylinder and obtained the exclusive services of the best Arabian and Moorish artists, holding them under contract, end quote. Clark further observed that, quote, all the good trade in the place goes to Konin, all the native trade goes to Yafil, end quote. That the so-called native trade went to Yafil owed to the fact that he operated much as North African Jewish merchants had in the previous century with regard to imported goods. Clark noted, for instance, that in, quote, Algeria, everything is sold on the installment plan. And to be able to do this, one must be a native of the place, end quote. As his co-religionists had done in the past, Yafil was extending credit to Muslim and Jewish clients, but now to purchase records. De Simon did not. Instead, he quarreled with Yafil. Clark reported that, quote, the result has been that Tessimon has the worst records on the market, end quote. Yafil, on the other hand, was expanding his operations. Clark informed Birnbaum that by 1905, quote, Yafil being anxious 
to do business, invited Odeon and Pate to come to Algeria and make records, end quote. And when the Eden label and Anchor record moved into Algeria between 1906 and 1908, Yafil was once again employed, this time as artistic director. In the course of Clark's 1908 visit to Algeria then, he concluded that Gramophone, the recording giant, needed Yafil. Yafil, a, record, a recording giant in the making, agreed. Clark announced to Birnbaum that, quote, we then fixed up Yafil to represent us, further to give us the services of all his tied up artists. I left Yafil highly delighted and a keen gramophone man, end quote. As for Tunisia, Clark transferred representation there from De Simon to the Bembarones, Jewish brothers and the major purveyors of Arabic language records in Tunis. Within moments of the first recording sessions in Algeria and Tunisia, Yafil had become synonymous with the emergent industry itself. Odeon Records, for example, branded in metropolitan France as Disque Audio, appeared in Algeria under the name of Disque Yafil, as you can see here. Disc Yafil records not only carried the name of Yafil, but also depicted the Islamic symbols of crescent, hand of Fatma, and five-pointed star. As for Pate, Yafil marked their earliest releases by providing spoken introductions to the music that followed. He announced the title of the song and then the name of the performer before pronouncing the record a product of, quote, collection Yafil, end quote, a phrase he had, in fact, trademarked since 1904. So here we're going to see if the audio works. Mm -hmm. So what I've done, what I've done here, uh, should this work, is taken the short introductions to three different records from the 19 aughts, uh, about 1908, and loop them together, and they play twice. So if you miss it, uh, you can hear it a second time. Uh, and this is Yafil pronouncing the record part of Collection Yafil. So whom did you feel record? Mostly other Jews. So much so that it at least one interwar critic derided Arab music in Algeria as little more than la musique juive, Jewish music. In Algiers, almost all of those Jews were in earshot of Yafil's base in the lower Kasbah. Some were even closer. Laho Saror, for example, shared Yafil's home office. Alfred Sassi Labrati, another early Algerian recording artist, lived around the corner. Moise Benciano, who recorded as part of an ensemble called Jama'iya al-Mutrabiya, resided down the street. As Malcolm Théodère has shown, the vast majority of al-Mutrabiya, Yafil's expanded interwar Andalusian orchestra, lived within 200 meters of one another. Although Jews from the Kasbah sometimes stood in for the near totality of artists featured in the debut Algerian record catalogs, Muslims from the same compact quarter were represented as well. Among them, Yemna, the, er the era's premier female artist, featured prominently. With her gifted voice, Yemna maintained the most important place in Pate's 1912 Algerian catalog, while also being the only non-Jewish artist on offer performing the Nuba. While the Jewishness of early 20th century recording in Algeria, or Tunisia, or Morocco, for that matter, is perhaps best understood as a question of degree rather than kind, Class, we need remember, was an important part of the equation. Yafil was the son of a restaurateur. Soror Sassi and Sfinja were cobblers. Indeed, while recording favored Jews, the industry remained an intimately Jewish Muslim affair of a certain social status from its outset. With Yafil acting as guide, record companies captured an impressive range of music. 
The vast Andalusian repertoire and its associated colloquial forms were but one piece of a larger whole. Hebrew paraliturgy, piyut, featured prominently in early record catalogs as well. So did Bedouin folk music, rural Kabili song, and all styles popular, topical, and comedic. It's a bit out of focus here, but as you can see, we've got a comedic song on the left there. Or if you can't see, I'm telling you, there's a comedic song <laughs> on the left there by a Muslim artist. We have Algerian, Arabic, Jewish comedy discs on the right, on the upper right. Uh, and at the uh, bottom right, we have uh, uh, the Hebrew chants of a certain uh, Mr. Twati. And you can see that these record catalogs are also multilingual as well. So we have Arabic script uh, on the left and the upper right, and then Hebrew script on the bottom right as well. For the record companies and their local representatives, the very genres, repertoires, and languages mattered little. It was sales that counted. All records were therefore quickly marketed as either Algerian or Arab, even if they were in fact Hebrew. While Yafil sold the Algerian Arab records, he played such a critical role in producing out of his office. Most, however, were initially distributed through much larger establishments. This included French record stores, but also local North African Jewish-owned enterprises like Bembaron. <coughs> Bembaron was founded by Jacques and Aurelio Bembaron in Tunis in 1903. It was born primarily a music store, but began to stock phonographs and records from the outset. Bembaron also came to hold exclusive concession in Tunisia for record labels based in metropolitan France. Gramophone, will recall, had transferred its Tunisian representation to the firm in 1908. In 1916, as the enterprise expanded in Tunisia, Jacques Bembaron dispatched his son-in-law Raoul Hazan to Morocco. To be sure, Hazan was a curious choice to lead their westward expansion. Most intriguingly, the individual tasked with cornering the record market there was nearly deaf. His political orientation also had the potential to bring him unwanted attention. Hazan was an active leftist. Still, he triumphed. In 1916, he established Bembaron and Hazan in Casablanca. By the 1920s, Bembaron and Hazan counted at least 10 branches in Morocco. In Tunisia, Bembaron also grew steadily. In the first decade after World War I, Bembaron boasted seven locations in the capital, Tunis, alone. In Algeria, meanwhile, it opened stores of varying size from Oran in the west to Constantine in the east. The transnational distribution network pioneered by Bembaron allowed for the entrance of other record labels to North Africa in the interwar period. French authorities initially encouraged this development, believing that recorded music served as a distraction from a set of burgeoning anti-colonial politics. In 1922, Baidefo, a label founded in Beirut, uh, Beirut around 1906, but which had long been headquartered in Berlin, was invited into Tunisia to record. By 1928, Columbia Records was asked to enter Morocco. At decades end, Parlophone, Polyphone, and others moved in across the Maghreb. Almost always, local Jews served as their a and r men. By the time of Yafil's death in 1928, the industry he had built had exploded. The press made note of his pioneering contribution, celebrating Yafil's hand in producing over 2,000 individual North African records as the crowning achievement of an otherwise astonishing career. That same year, Gramophone reported that Bembaron and Hazan in Morocco was selling tenfold more Arabic records there than French offerings. These, of course, were just the figures for Gramophone in Morocco. When factoring the dozen plus labels operating in North Africa, in North Africa then, the extent numbers only begin to capture the burgeoning and booming commercial trade in phonograph records there, not to mention the discs that were passed around after purchase. But much as much as the growth of the industry relied on a largely Jewish infrastructure of music purveyors, it also continued to rest overwhelmingly on Jewish talent. In 1928, as Algerian Jews and Muslims mourned the loss of Yafil, that talent had a name, and it was Habib Masika. Everyone doing okay so far? Okay. In April 1928, the 25-year-old Tunisian Jewish Masika headed to Berlin to record with the Bayerifon label. 
That 1928 Baidufon session would represent a number of firsts for the musician, an actor described by Bashtarzi in his memoirs as the, quote, embodiment of the Arab artist, end quote. In a German studio, Masika would record electric electrically with a microphone instead of a horn for the first time. It was also the, for the, it was also the first time that the Malikat Atarab, the queen of musical ecstasy, as she was known, recorded beyond the bounds of the French protectorate of Tunisia. There, she veered headlong into the political. Nearly a year after the great Syrian revolt had been suppressed by French forces, this is in 1927, Masika, North Africa's first superstar, superstar and oft referred to as the second Sarah Bernhardt, made a record entitled Anti Suriya Biladi, Syria, You Are My Country. Indeed, the Middle Eastern uprising continued to inspire anti-colonial nationalists in North Africa, including Masika, even after its suppression. Although Masika was not the only artist to record Syria, You Are My Country, her interpretation was among the most sought-after discs of the era. Beyond helping to establish Baidafon among North Africans, the record which traveled widely ensured Masika a global Arab audience, including in the growing syro lebanese diaspora said, spread from Buenos Aires to Detroit. I'm going to play a snippet of it here. Why not? Um, here you can see the Baidafon label. Uh, Habiba Masika's name, the title of the song, in parentheses it says on piano as well. Uh, and that you can see that it once belonged to a, a member of the Syrian diaspora uh, in Detroit. civil controllers and the residents general of Morocco and Tunisia and the governor general of Algeria into a panic. That panic would turn to terror in the aftermath of Masika's murder by a male fan on February 21st, 1930. On February 23rd, 1930, the office of the resident general in Tunisia sent a hurried note to the director of public security. From the morning papers, the office had, the office had gleaned that Masika's funeral, scheduled for February 24th, just days before the end of Ramadan, had been postponed from the morning to the afternoon by the Jewish community so that more Muslim mourners could attend. Not mentioned in the press, however, was a particularly actionable piece of intelligence. As one minister stated in no uncertain terms, quote, Habiba Masika has been in the service of the Desturians for the last few years, end quote. That Masika had found common cause with the anti-colonial nationalist Desur led the director of public security to call for, quote, the most serious observation of what was to take place at the funeral, end quote. The day of, 5,000 Jews and Muslims accompanied Masika to her final resting place in the capital's Jewish cemetery. Particularly worrisome was the fact that these Jews and Muslims, quote, belonged to all classes of the population, end quote. As one official stated, quote, never before in Tunisia has such a funeral taken place, end quote. In May 1930, just months past Masika's death, Baidafon sent a shipment of records from Germany to Ben Baron and Hazan in Morocco. It was business as usual as far as the two companies were concerned. The French security services, however, were acclimating to a new reality. On May 16, 1930, the civil controller of Morocco's Wadzem region wrote with trepidation to his superiors in Rabat, that, quote, hidden in a batch of records of Arabo and Delusion music was a disc entitled, quote, The National Anthem of Moroccan Youth, end quote, 
recorded by the Moroccan Muslim musician to Hamid ben Omar. But civil control headquarters were already aware of ben Omar's national anthem. Since Ben Baron and Hazan had begun selling it, reports on the nationalist hymn had been flooding their office. And by May 16, 1930, the stakes had been raised considerably. That same day, Morocco's resident general, insulted Mohammed ben Yusuf, promulgated the Berber Diet, a decree which attempted to segregate Berbers from Arabs through a dualistic legal system, a move seen by many as a violation of Islamic law. The Berber Dahir set off months of protests that fed a growing nationalist movement, which had now possibly secured its anthem. In fact, the civil controller of Wadzem described Ben Omar's record as nothing, nothing less than a, quote, Moroccan Marseillaise, end quote. Given the climate, civil controllers redoubled their efforts to seize copies of the harmful disc. But even at its outset, the search quickly shifted away from Ben Omar and toward Masika, whose 1928 recording of another anthem for Vitaphone, the Egyptian national anthem, proved enduringly popular among Moroccans. On May 5th, 1930, hot on the trail of Ben Omar's Moroccan Marseillaise, security agents zeroed in on Mustafa and Sharfi, a Muslim merchant who was found to be renting phonographs in the nationalist hot hotbed of Fez. Lamsharfi's rentals included 20 records, many of which, according to the author of an unsigned report, had the effect of, quote, stirring up Arab feelings, end quote. An informant passed on a partial list of those discs. Each was by Masika, including her Egyptian national anthem. On May 30th, 1930, yet another civil controller sent an urgent message to headquarters. The civil controller of Dukala wrote that, quote, it has been signaled to me that a record label in Berlin has sent phonograph records to Morocco in favor of Egyptian independence, which are prone to provoke unrest in the Muslim milieu, end quote. He identified the culprit as Masika's Egyptian national anthem. But the characterization of her records as prone to wreak havoc was too little too late. According to the same report, Masika's record was already, quote, a huge success among the natives of Mazagan, a Muslim milieu, that held a sizable my Jewish minority. Apparently Jewish and Muslim residents of Mazagan were, quote, excited by the rousing music and words hailing liberty. They sing it in groups full of energy, in sync with the phonograph, and accompany themselves on guitar and mandolin, end quote. Given the scale of the Masika problem, the authorities concluded that by the phone needed reining in, but of course the label was only part of the problem. Quote, it is relatively easy to control the importation of records made by the large and medium-sized firms, end quote, wrote the Director General of the Military Cabinet in Morocco on February 27, 1931. False confidence aside, his concern instead was the mushrooming of small record labels of unknown origin engaged in the, quote, clandestine fabrication of records, end quote. Arabic records. One of those outfits, in which ca curiously carried an English language name, Arabic record, was particularly vexing. According to Lieutenant Colonel Margot, director of the Protectorate's official Arabic language newspaper, some Arabic record releases had already, quote, wet the appetite of our Moroccans, end quote, by which he meant their taste for nationalism. Among those causing a stir were those that only listed the performer as Malikat Atarab, Using her sobriquet in place of her real name, an Arabic record was bootlegging Masika's by the phone records. Or perhaps Arabic record was by the phone itself. Either way, that a minor label of unclear provenance could sell Masika's records years after her murder without inscribing her name anywhere, signaled the scale of the nationalist problem in Morocco, which was joining Jews and Muslims together with or without by the phone. While civil controllers chased Masika's records, a more robust response to her problematic discs was considered. In the early 1930s, a legislative committee attached to the residence general met thrice in an attempt to decide the fate of records entering the protectorate. The legislation, however, would await approval for several years as bureaucrats jostled over best censorship practices. <laughs> Meanwhile, other nationalist records, this time made by Algerian Jews, were again sounding the alarm. Over the next decade, security agents found that the Masika record stirring national passion so was being distributed in large part by Moroccan Jews. 
In November 1930, for example, the head of regional security in Marrakesh caught Magdoshe Simini training in Masika's anthem from his shop adjacent to the Jewish quarter. Like others found with the record at the time, Simini refused to incriminate Raoul Hazan, from whom the subversive disc had been purchased. By 1937, faced with their own Mesika predicament in Algeria, Bashar Asmati, a Muslim officer in the Bureau of Native Affairs there, delivered an impassioned address on the subject of, quote, the Arabic language record, end quote. He lamented the fact that, quote, Jewish merchants had become auxiliaries, most of the time unwittingly, of a form of anti-French propaganda, of nationalist and pan-Arabist ideas of Middle Eastern importation, end quote but that Jewish purveyors of music, or music makers themselves, were unwitting that Mavdoshe Simini, Ben Barone and Hazan, Habiba Masika, and those who sang along to her recordings knew not of what they were doing, there's little evidence in the archival record. Throughout the interwar period, Jews, alongside Muslims, endured harassment by French officials, confiscation of their goods, and worse, all in the pursuit of, quote, rousing music and words hailing liberty, end quote. <clears throat> and as the French in North Africa moved into silence Masika, other actors filled the void. In 1939, Nazi Germany began broadcasting the Jewish musician's interpretation of the Egyptian national anthem as part of a radio war to win the hearts and minds of the Maghreb's Muslims. By way of conclusion, then, we pick up just after World War II's end. This time with another emblematic figure, a Moroccan whose recordings may very well permit us to alter the post-war timeline for Jews and Muslims. In April 1948, Salomon Amzalab, 26, was tapped by a certain L.A. Vatro, the head of Pate in Morocco, to make a series of records for the label. Since childhood, Amzalag had been singing, first at the Sabbath table in the coastal city of Safi, then in the capital Rabat, later in the synagogue, and more recently for a growing number of admirers in Casablanca. Vadra, however, did not just intend for the young Moroccan Jewish musician to be but one artist among many. Rather, he believed Amzalag to be the label's future in post-war North Africa. Describing him as, quote, indispensable to the effort of revitalizing our Arab catalog, end quote. In 1948, then, as forms of anti colonial nationalism emerged that increasingly circumscribed Moroccan and Arab identity in ways that could exclude Jews, Pate saw little issue with a Moroccan Jew serving as anchor to their Arab catalog, nor would his Jewish and Muslim audiences. And just as 1948, the year marking Israel's creation and the Palestinian Nakba, has often been regarded by scholars as marking that final exile, the final separation of Jews from Muslims, the end of Moroccan Jews in situ as hundreds then thousands began to depart, in 1948, a Moroccan Jew was beginning his meteoric ascent to national spotlight. He did so under the stage name of Sami al maghrabi Sami the Moroccan making explicit his identification with the nation at a most critical moment. Neither 1948 nor Moroccan independence in 1956 were an end for al Maghrebi, who not only remained in Morocco during those years, as did 160,000 other Jews until 1960, but whose astonishing climb to national and transnational stardom were measured by them. So how iconic was he? Well, by 1952, and Maghrebi had become the official voice of Coca-Cola in Morocco. <laughs> His spoken dialogues and musical hooks for the soft drink company were played in heavy rotation on Moroccan radio over the next several years. During this period, the musician became the sound of brands like Gillette, Palmolive, and Shell Oil as well. In one such ad, which we're about to hear, for Angel Chewing Gum, the artist, his wife, and children sang the virtue of the company's many flavors while backed by a small orchestra. 
By the end of 1952, then, every Moroccan within earshot of radio could hear al Maghrebi singing, quote, I sweeten my palate with angel chewing gum, end quote, with the near universal resonance of the mid-century ra radio jingle. So uh, again, let's see if this plays. Uh, transition from the colonial period to the independence era, and Maghrebi then was providing Moroccan with the soundtrack to their lives. El Maghrebi, whom one Tangiers newspaper referred to in the 1950s as, quote, the greatest Arab attraction of all time, end quote, arrived at that moment by pioneering what came to be known as modern Moroccan music and by espousing what we might call Moroccanism a mainstream variant of anti-colonial nationalism inclusive of Muslims and Jews that placed Sultan Mohammed bin Yusuf at its ideological center. On Morocco's largest stages and on its most symbolic ones like the royal palace, and Maghrebi thus donned the national colors of red and green, toured alongside Muslims, and sang of and for the nation. That he was bringing Jews and Muslims together was a point of pride for him. On August 24th, 1951, three years after his recording debut, he wrote to his brother Simon in Marseille with the following, quote, my success in Morocco is immense and I am recognized and surrounded very quickly no matter which city I'm in. Everyone points out Sammy with their finger, with a smile. My great successes of the day are hung by Arabs and Jews, the young and old, men and women in all the cities of Morocco. Again in 1952, on the highly symbolic occasion of Throne Day, a holiday which marked the anniversary of Sultan Mohammed bin Yusuf's original ascension to the throne, the Sultan himself requested the presence of al Maghrebi. As usual, he wrote to Simon with a sumptuous play-by-play. -play. Just after midnight on November 18, 1952 then, al Maghrebi sang two of his uh, patriotic compositions and other songs, quote, before some 2,000 Muslims and before Crown Prince Moulay Hassan, who resided over the soiree where the best musical troops of Morocco had passed through, end quote. Al Maghrebi beamed that, quote, my success has exceeded my wildest dreams. The ovation given, me to, by, given to me by the public was nothing like the applause received by other artists. Then came the congratulations of all the Muslim personalities, which touched me, end quote that both Muslims and Jews were coalescing around the Jewish artist was noted by others as well. In April 1953, French intelligence officials wrote to their superiors of an El Maghrebi concert in Mazagan, the same city where Masika's records had once riled so, describing a, quote, hall packed with an audience composed exclusively of Moroccans, Muslims and Jews who were pleased with the event, end quote. A certain H. Abdel Qadr, Writing in the Algerian daily Le Depeche Quotidienne just after the start of the Algerian War, declared El Maghrebi's December 1954 concert at the Opera of Algiers a triumph. The journalist was delighted that the largely Muslim audience had included, quote, many Jews who have come to applaud their idol, end quote. In the mid-1950s then, it appeared that the Jewish Muslim past had yet to pass even as war gripped Algeria. The same was true for Morocco as it navigated independence. Here we can see Sami al Maghrebi on the cover of uh, uh, a radio publication, Huna uh, Jazair. Uh, here is uh, Algiers. On May 15, 1956, 
two months since Moroccan liberation from France, Al Maghrebi wrote to Simon with an update from Casablanca. Quote, Saturday night, I recorded verses in classical Arabic for Radio Maroc, including a military song extolling the glory of His Majesty, Moroccan freedom, and the Royal Armed Forces. This was the only Moroccan song presented to radio listeners on the occasion of the army's first parade, end quote. Mm -hmm. Al-Maghribi added that he had been flooded by both compliments and record orders since the broadcast of the song. Ten days later, he recorded Allah Watani wa Sultani, God, my country, and my sultan, the song that was causing a frenzy across the country. In this post-independence nationalist effort, Al Maghrebi was joined by other Jewish artists who recorded their support for the Sultan and the Moroccan nation to disc. Only a few of them, however, were as expressly militaristic as Al Maghrebi. Allah Watani wa Sultani, for example, was a self-described military march, which not only glorified the Sultan and the cause of independence, but so to Moroccans, whom we refer to throughout as soldiers. So we'll take a listen to that now. Donat Sami Fon, Sami Al Maghribi. Allah, Watani wa Sultani, da maksud kul askri Maghribi, wa maksud kul askri Maghribi. Allah, Watani wa Sultani. أمرك يا ربنا الرحمن أمرك يا ربنا الرحمن وفضلك يا سيدنا السلطان وفضلك يا سيدنا السلطان وبجود زعماء الوطن مغربنا مستقل that's my fade out again. I have a very niche career ahead of me if this doesn't work out. Exactly. As Algeria is a metropolitan France, in an, and, and in Algeria itself, soon adopt the Jewish artist anthem, El Maghrebi's brother warned that the military march was, quote, causing a furor here and in the Arab world, end quote, and that he need exercise caution moving forward vis-a-vis -vis the French. When El Maghrebi did eventually leave Morocco in 1959, he did so for a set of complicated reasons, including one born of gossip. On March 1st, 1959, he informed Simon that rumors were circulating about his, quote, final departure following an expulsion order, end quote. In the same breath, he announced that he intended to hold a press conference in his apartment to dispel the false charge. Before that could happen, however, he wrote to Simon again, quote, it has become clear that the noise bubbling up around me was due to an erroneous interpretation of the truth, end quote. Apparently, the rumor, mill, the rumor mill had confused El Maghrebi for another palace favorite, the Algerian Jewish Salim Halali, who may have been temporarily forced out of Morocco days earlier. That a darling of the Moroccan monarch like Halali could be summarily expelled in the independence era understandably unnerved the Jewish musician. El Maghrebi, of course, was more than just an artist. He was also a father of six. Furthermore, the entire conflagra conflagration had surfaced in the midst of a serious economic crisis. At the same time, a new cut Moroccan customs regime was making the transnational affairs of Semifon, his brick and mortar stores and record label, ever more difficult to operate. He made a decision with his family in mind. He left. Other cultural figures would too. Months after his departure, word had reached him that the Muslim recording artist Ahmed Jabran had been jailed by the regime. Soon thereafter, Jabran arrived in exile in Washington, DC. Al Maghrebi's concern for the well-being of him and his family appeared to have been well-founded. When he returned to Morocco in May 1967 to give a series of concerts, the press met the national icon on the airport tarmac. Quote, who are you, Sami Al Maghrebi? End quote, a reporter asked provocatively of the artist. Without missing a beat, he responded, quote, first of all, a Moroccan, end quote. Let me offer some brief final thoughts before I take questions. 
In tracing the trajectories of but a handful of musical figures and their sounds, I have endeavored to record a different history of the Maghreb and the Jewish Muslim past there through a history of recording itself. Among other things, the sound approach has allowed us to situate the early 20th century Algerian figure of Edmond Netanyahu, not in, re in relation to his French citizenship per se, but as a sonic nation builder of sorts, who established an industry dedicated to Arab music's future, which was largely grounded in a Jewish base of a certain class enmeshed in its surrounds. It has also permitted us to tease out an interwar moment in which the Tunisian Habiba Masika, an anti-colonial nationalist, sang of Syria and Egypt to the great delight of Moroccan Muslim and Jewish audiences, and which held grave political consequences for what could be heard in the region until the end of World War II. Finally, it has also enabled us to reanimate the post-war life of the Moroccan Sami al-Maghrabi, whose voice brought Jews and Muslims together in the push for his country's independence well after Jews and Muslims were supposed to have gone their separate ways. There are other takeaways here for scholars of the region and those focused on modern Jewish history therein. Or therein. With sound, music, and recordings, for example, social status is surfaced, cities thought previously unconnected are connected, horizontal movement is privileged, women quite literally take center stage, forms of nationalism outside of political party manifest themselves, and social dynamics, especially during the transition to decolonization, are better understood. The question that remains now is whether all of this should be treated as somehow exceptional. I believe to do so, however, is to silence. It is to silence the musicians, each a world unto themselves, and only a fraction of which were mentioned today. It is to silence their vast audiences, the large numbers of historical actors for whom so many of us are invested in better comprehending. It is to silence their music and the meaning of that music, nationalized and otherwise, but always of consequence which set hearts aflame and continues to do so in profane spaces and sacred ones alike. To be sure, this is a history not of political culture, but culture as politics. A history that sounds different from its devocalized analogs, but one that resonates deep into the present and may very well change how we think about the past. Thank you. Two quick questions. One is, how can we listen to the music um, online <laughs> or otherwise? Um, and the other question is around, so it's interesting, for years I've had many Shabbat recordings of Sami al maghrabi mm -hmm. And I, so like hearing his gum commercial was mm -hmm. really amazing. And I'm wondering whether, like was it, so he went, he went to France? That's what I want to know what happened where he when he moved, and also if he came, like if he had always recorded liturgical music as well, or that was a later edition. Yeah, can I, can I write on this whiteboard? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 How's that for a catchy URL? Wow. So, uh, so uh, I, uh, as Orrin mentioned earlier, I've been collecting for some time, uh, perhaps too long, but for some time. Uh, and so there's a couple ways that you can access these recordings. You can come visit in Montreal. Yeah. Easier thing to do is to uh, head to this uh, URL. Uh, it's, it's a play on words that is uh, funny to but a few of us. Uh, and it's sort of like gramophone, but it's gharam meaning love in Arabic, and gharamophone, because gharam is sort of a, a, a frequent uh, theme of uh, Arabic uh, language music, and so um, I get a chuckle out of it, a few others do. And, but anyway, here it is. Uh, and so what I, what I endeavor to do is uh, is to collect this music to sort of 
repatriated in its own way, so sort of wherever I can find the earliest recordings um, to, get, to, to get those online as quickly as possible um, so that those who are uh, intimately connected to the music um, can hear it again for the first time in a long time. I should be speaking into a microphone, shouldn't I? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Excuse me. I hopefully everyone caught that, uh, uh, so that uh, people can connect to it. Uh, and and for for those who are native speakers, which I'm not a native, I'm a speaker, but not a native speaker, um, will be able to hear things in music, or their parents or their grandparents will be able to hear things in music of a century ago that I'll never be able to, to hear, uh, but references they'll be able to pick up. So that's where you can hear the music. As for as for Samuel Mogherini, uh, he begins his career much as I described it. So it does begin in 1948. Uh, in May 1948, he will leave uh, Morocco for France to record. So not to Israel, but for France to record. Uh, and he's recording a popular music, a, a popular music that he will grow less interested in with time. But that's true of uh, many recording artists. They distance themselves from their early repertoire because it's not serious. Okay. Uh, in time, he will take on uh, the task of recording ever more uh, serious uh, music, so sort of uh, Andalusian music, sort of mo most broadly speaking. Uh, he will he will uh, he will do a series of recordings uh, of that. Uh, he will leave Morocco in in, in 1959. Uh, he will spend some time in Paris uh, before coming to Montreal where he comes to serve as the uh, Hazan of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue there, and where he'll undertake a number of uh, liturgical recordings, uh, both Moroccan and uh, of, the, of the Sephardi right, yeah, yeah. so the non-Moroccan uh, uh, Sephardi right, also record in Ladino and things like that. Uh, the family also owned uh, a bakery in, in Montreal, and so, of course, the community was changed in, in Montreal. Uh, it was different, and so he took on a different role, but still using his voice, uh, and he would, as he got settled there, he would go back to um, recording uh, Arabic language music again, uh, and sort of um, some of it was it was an answer. Some of the music he recorded uh, was an answer to some critics who who would ask him how a religious figure could could sing secular music. And he has, a, he has a beautiful song which you can find uh, online, Nirani uh, Wonsali, I sing and I pray, uh, basically demonstrating that there, for those who know, there is no disconnect between the two, in the fact that they're intimately connected. As I said earlier, he gets his start at the Sabbath table, uh, where many Jewish uh, artists will get their start uh, before sort of uh, migrating to the mainstream of Arab popular music. Um, you mentioned a nodal shift within a specific technological kind of change within that industry. Um, that really caught my attention. I was really curious if there was a specific time or event that, that you were referencing, or if it was the whole thing. Thanks. That, was, that, that one line was for you, uh, in <laughs> fact. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, there, there's a bigger question that, that will interest some, but not, but not all here, about sort of how did global recording work exactly? What was the apparatus? How did records move? Which cities were connected? How does a, a place like Algiers as a nodal point fit into this uh, transnational system? And so that also is what this work is attempting to do, sort of helping us to better understand how we get these recordings in the first place. Uh, who was the scout on the ground? Who was their, who was the artist and repertoire person, man? Uh, how, uh, how were the recordings made in the first place? Where, right? Not recording studios, usually hotel rooms or hotel ballrooms. Uh, and then where did masters get sent to? Where did they get sent back to? Who distributed these things? And so uh, the global recording industry is at least 120 years old, but we actually have recordings much earlier than that as well. Um, uh, 
uh, some already in the 1860s. Um, and so this is an industry that is uh, critical to who we are, right? I mean, now it's, it's not what it once was. It's Spotify and, and whatever else. Um, but it's important to understand its origins because recording technology changed how we lived our lives, changed how we uh, listened. Uh, changed how we understood uh, sounds, music, etc. And so I'm trying to um, to write but a small piece of this history from its North African vantage point. class this semester on medieval Spain yes. and a few of my students are here and I was wondering if for them and maybe for the other rest of the audience you could say a little bit about what makes this Andalusian music <laughs> that's a great question that's a great question so um, in fact we heard no Andalusian music tonight so l l let me just preface it uh, uh, by saying that um, so uh, the, the high art repertoire in North Africa is uh, referred to in sort of blanket terms as Andalusian music, as some of it emerges out of medieval Islamic Iberia. Uh, so uh, not necessarily the music itself, but the song text, the poems uh, uh, which are sung, um, some of them have origins, again, in, in medieval Al-Andalus, uh, and not just at that moment of 1492, not just at that moment of uh, rupture, uh, but, but earlier as well. Uh, so for example, uh, there, there are overlapping Andalusian traditions, right, because Al-Andalus was, was a vast territory as, you, as you're learning. Uh, so there were overlapping, uh, uh, and there are overlapping Andalusian uh, uh, repertoires performed across North Africa, okay, from Morocco uh, uh, to Libya. In some places, in some cases, the names for those repertoires bear the mark of Al Andalus, so the names themselves. So, for example, uh, in uh, in Algeria, sometimes the music is referred to as Granata, okay, from Granada, uh, and so uh, some of the oldest uh, song texts deal with the same themes, because they were the same themes, uh, born of the, the poetry, uh, the great Arabic language poetry uh, of, of uh, um, medieval uh, Islamic Iberia. Uh, there, there's a more complicated answer, but uh, I, hopefully that, that, that suffices. Of course, um, things change over time, so nothing emerges whole cloth out of uh, 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 medieval uh, uh, Iberia and then is just transported and transplanted into North Africa. Um, but there is an understanding that its origins can be traced to Al-Andalus, uh, where many Jews and Muslims also trace their origins as well. So there's a linkage um, uh, sonically as well as uh, genealogically there too. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that a couple of these singers were really protest singers against the French occupation. I mean, I know that's not everything that they sang about, but, but those were some of their most popular songs, and it does seem to be kind of a Jewish tradition. We have Jewish protest singers in our country as well. Um, and, you know, and at the same time, they were French citizens. Yeah, Tunisian yes. Jews, Algerian Jews, and Moroccan Jews, right? No, just Algerian Jews. Oh, just, oh, okay, all right. So I just wonder, did they, did they represent what a significant portion of the Jewish population felt about the French occupation? And I guess I have a, a number of questions about that. And what was it like for them to be really in between as so many Jewish people are in so many places in the world? Do those two questions make sense? Uh, those are great questions. Um, so, uh, 
Part of, part of it, let me, I don't know, I'll do sort of the 10,000 feet and then try, try and, try and uh, get to your specific question. So number one is when we look at uh, North African Jewish history, we tend to use only French sources, and we as sort of historians and scholars and whatever. Uh, what I'm attempting to show in part is that uh, once we sort of listen for the Arabic sources, a different history reveals itself. <clears throat> Moroccan and Tunisian Jews, for the most part, were not uh, French citizens. Algerian Jews were. Uh, I also said in, in a line that initially it's, it's, it's something that's forced upon them. So there's, there's a notion in 1870 that Algerian Jews are sort of going to volunteer for this citizenship. Uh, when the pace of that uh, volunteering is not fast enough, then it's forced upon them, which means that they have to give up Jewish law. They have to give up Jewish law for French law. And so initially, there are people who resist, okay, for, for all sorts of reasons. For example, at the time, in 1870, uh, according to French law, divorce was not permitted, okay, which complicates uh, 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 those who would follow Jewish law. In Algeria, uh, Jews sometimes uh, practiced polygamy as well, which was in, in contrast to French law. So not everybody was sort of running uh, to French citizenship or the French legal system uh, uh, in 1870. Uh, the other question I think that's important to ask is sort of uh, um, what legal status reveals and what it doesn't reveal. So clearly they were French citizens, whether they spoke French or whether they spoke Arabic or, or whatever it is. Um, the, the question in some way can be turned around in terms of how representative is the, the normal uh, uh, Algerian Jewish historiography that we, we tend to focus on. Okay, so we tend to focus on uh, 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 history that deals with elite individuals, men almost entirely, uh, again, French language sources, when in reality the vast majority of North African Jews uh, from the beginning of the 20th century through mid 20th century uh, were not the elite. They were the working and laboring classes uh, who, again, in some cases, remained intimately enmeshed with Muslim. We can put Morocco and Tunisia aside, for example, we can look to a place like Algeria, where that legal segregation is so, uh, uh, so striking. Um, through 1962, the year of Algerian uh, independence, Jews and Muslims are not just living together in the same cities or in the same quarters, but sometimes in the same uh, shared building. So a single uh, uh, apartment building with a, with a shared courtyard at the center, uh, where it's subdivided by rooms, and Jews are in one room, Muslims in another room, and Jews in one room, and Muslims in another room. So the question of how representative uh, is, uh, is a tricky one, and also I think uh, sometimes we need to do history that isn't always representative, uh, representative right? We have to um, write history that, uh, that is both about successes but also about failures as well, about paths not taken but that could have been taken. Uh, but I think that once we sort of get beyond our French source language base, once we sort of look beyond uh, French uh, uh, legal status as the only barometer of how Jews felt about their situation in Algeria, we come to an understanding that not all were comfortable with what was going on. In fact, many were advocates of independence, nationalism, or something like that. Probably have time for one or two more questions, if anyone wants to ask. I've been watching you sort of for a long time collect all these records, and I'm curious to know what it's like when you find like this rare gem to add to this archive, and how you find the record shops or whatever stores to, to sort of build this archive. Uh, I, I would probably be embarrassed to see my own face when I, um, <laughs> when I have it upon. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, as a, to go back to, to your question as well, I mean, 
what I'm trying what I'm trying to do is uh, is work with different types of archival sources. Okay, uh, so um, not just sort of um, archives of state and archives of official institution, but archives records of a different sort, uh, sound recordings uh, that that offer us. Um, all sorts of, of, of insight into the past, not just the sounds that are buried between the grooves, um, but what's written on the labels uh, uh, as well. So um, here, for example, we can glean much, right? So here, one of the first, if not the first, uh, independent labels in uh, Morocco, Semiphone, appropriately named. Um, here, in Arabic, just under eight, uh, can anyone, do we have any Arabic readers here? Nasheed Maghrabi. So Nasheed uh, has a number of meanings. Uh, it can mean anthem, um, but it can also have uh, an Islamic religious quality to it as well. Okay, so it sort of signals here many things, uh, and we can glean that uh, 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 from from just just the label itself, for, forgetting about uh, uh, again the buried sounds um, in its grooves. Um, so that's that's one of the things I'm trying to do is to assemble an archive for other scholars as well. Uh, again, for the communities who this music belongs to, and I'm, I'm attempting to sort of repatriate as best I can. So every record uh, that I find, it is, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm not USF, but it's, it's by the grace of something that, uh, <laughs> uh, that enables me to happen upon this thing, uh, uh, buried in bric-a-brac stores from Tunis to Tel Aviv, uh, from Morocco to Montreal, etc. Uh, and you know, sometimes I, uh, you know, so sometimes Marie Kondo is, is in my head, right? <laughs> uh, and so maybe I, I shouldn't keep uh, assembling and collecting. Um, but perhaps this is the last chance. Uh, already some of these recordings are well over a century uh, old. Uh, and uh, it may be true that in some cases, some of these recordings are held by other institutions. Um, but things happen at other institutions. Things happen at archives, or they're just not accessible. Uh, tagged with infinite amounts of metadata, but not accessible unless you have username and password. So I'm sort of, I'm attempting to cut through that, uh, to bring these uh, sounds and voices back to their public. Uh, and uh, I think more so than finding the records themselves is that ping or email I get from the descendants uh, that really sort of sets my heart aflame. Uh, in some cases, uh, recently someone emailed me who's the grandson of someone I posted about who bears the name of his grandfather. So I got a name from the artist himself by way of his, his grandson. And who told me that he had never heard his grandfather's voice awesome. before. Uh, and so th this has happened on multiple occasions. And um, I think this is part of the work we need to do is scholars, historians, and members of a, a community bigger than ourselves. Well, thank you for your work. Mm -hmm.